everybody. Welcome to This Week in Birding. It's our season finale. We're back after a bit of a hiatus, but it's good to be back. Uh, Josh and I have been off doing various different things, but Josh, how are, how are things going to do? Uh, yeah, pretty well here. Um, you know, in terms of birding tourism and Red Hill birding, you know, things are very slow right now, of course, because nobody's traveling. Um, you know, people I think are starting to do some weekend trips, local driving trips and stuff, but uh, most people still don't want to get on an airplane. So um, it's a very difficult time for the, the tourism industry in general. Birding tourism, of course, is part of that. So, um, you know, one thing I've done to adjust is I've I offered some local trips uh, around the Chicago area in June. There was a really amazing response uh, to those. So those were great. We did, uh, I believe, eight trips to places like Kankakee Sands in Indiana, Goose Lake in uh, McHenry County near the Wisconsin state line. You know, some real hot spots where you can go out and see a lot of really interesting birds, grassland birds and wetland birds in particular. Um, so that was great. I'll offer those again uh, starting in the fall. This is sort of the, the birding lull of the midsummer where nesting birds go quiet and uh, there's only a, the first few shorebirds trickling south. So. I'm going to pick them up in the fall, and then we'll see what happens with some of my uh, bigger tours that I've planned for the fall, because uh, it was supposed to be a very busy fall for me, going leading trips in U.S., Africa, Asia, um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens with those, but i um, looking forward to doing local trips in the meantime. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's great. I, I saw some of the lists coming from places like Kankakee Sands, and it was just blown away. That's yeah, such a vast area. And that, it's an that, awesome area. Yeah, for and and kudos to you for like getting right to where the the really interesting <laughs> species are and showing that showing them to people and making that accessible. Yeah. How are how are things with you? Great, yeah. I mean, uh, I've been busy, and you know, a big uh, part of my time has been as a plover monitor uh, here in year two of Monty and Rose, and um, I'm thinking about. Uh, how to create another film about the birds and have just started um, with some filming with our videographer, Mitch Wankus out at the beach. Um, you know, it's been a very different year. I mean, the story has, I think, gone um, in some interesting directions. I think, I think with the, uh, we'll, we'll get back to this in our uh, top five, but I think with the, um, the beach closure that's, um, uh, created some uh, maybe new storylines. And, um, and then I think there's a big opportunity to still tell some backstory and, and provide some of the history of, um, of, of the birds and, and Montrose Beach. So that's likely where it's headed. So uh, it's gonna be fun to kind of um, get re-engaged with that project and with, um, uh, with all the people who've made it possible over the past now uh, 12 months or so. So, um, so we're going to uh, turn to our, our, this is our season finale, really the season finale is referring to this end of spring migration ostensibly. And, um, and Josh and I wanted to talk today about the, the top moments of spring migration. And so um, there, there's a, a lot that happened um, this spring, I guess, I, I don't know if it's the same as any spring, but it seemed like a lot um, was going on. Um, but uh, you know, we, we kind of narrowed down a list and I, I had, there was sort of a best of the rest that, uh, of local sightings that we wanted to touch on. Um, for me, uh, the best of the rest was highlighted by, that didn't quite make our top five moments. Um, for me, the one I wanted to call out was a painted bunting showing up in the Westridge neighborhood of Chicago. Um, this is a, a residential neighborhood in the interior of Chicago, and it's just one of those things that birding dreams are made of. Like you're walking down the street, and all you're seeing are house sparrows and pigeons, and uh, you know maybe robins or cardinals, and then uh, then you have a painted bunting sitting on the roof of someone's uh, house, <laughs> and um, that you know that that was just I think an incredible sighting, and, and Jeff Scrantney went out and got a great photo of it. And um, so, uh, you know, there's just, that that to me uh, is sort of a dream sighting. And so uh, I, I, I picked that one um, just because it, it seemed uh, kind of unlikely in a very- Yeah, and in terms of local sightings, my, my 
best of the rest of wild turkeys that seem to be wandering around the city and still are. There was a report from uh, Rainbow Beach on the lakefront on the south side just the other day. Um, but wild turkeys were gone from Illinois about 100 years ago. Um, there were some reintroductions that uh, were very successful, you know, and that's primarily um, they were hunted out and the reintroductions um, and a lot of the efforts to um, improve turkey conservation have been driven by hunting, but um, they've done very well. And now we have them in forest reserves, especially suburban forest reserves, and they've been slowly but steadily making their way closer and closer to the city itself, to Chicago itself. And uh, the last couple of years, they've been seen uh, wandering right through the city. So um, there's one scene in Rogers Park and then presumably the same one uh, walked north into Evanston, just a couple of blocks from my house. Um, uh, happened to be on the, the block that Isu O'Brien, who's a local birder, lives on. He went out and saw it. Unfortunately, by the time that all the other local birders showed up, we couldn't find it. Um, so it's been amazing, and I think we're going to be seeing more and more turkeys um, in all of Cook County and, and in the interior of the city more and more in the coming years. So I think there's a trend there. Yeah, and it's just, they seem like much more of a, um, they live up to their name of wild turkey. And it's sort of symbolic of what I consider to be wilder places um, normally. So this is, um, you know, kind of kind of a stunner that, that you know, maybe there's some, uh, and I don't know if it speaks to the, you know, increasing habitat restoration, you know, efforts that are taking place or if this is some change in their behavior. But I mean, it's a uh, pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah, and well, when you think about it, you know, they're ground dwelling birds, they, they don't fly very much at all. So you'd think they'd be very prone to uh, not surviving long in cities between dogs, cars, coyotes. Um, but uh, apparently, you know, they're, they're wily enough to, to be successful and at least in their wanderings. Um, yeah, the funny thing is about Isu is he was so psyched to get the wild turkey, I think, in the southeast corner of Cook County early in the spring and mm -hmm. turn up on his block. So, yeah. for you, though. Um, so, uh, so, turning to the top five. So, we're going to count down from five to number one. And uh, our number five pick is going to be the year of the cuckoo. Uh, so um, cuckoos, primarily, I think yellow-billed cuckoos, have been seemingly turning up everywhere throughout the area this year. And from what I heard, it was due to it's a good cicada year. And I think uh, I think cuckoos feed on cicadas, if that's right. Um, so I, it, um, these are pretty um, secretive birds. They're relatively slow moving and and hard to find typically and, and spot, um, I, at least for me, I've heard them more than I've seen them traditionally. Um, and so it just seems like they're turning up in places like suburban backyards. I'm pretty sure I heard one on my street, which is in an urban area. So um, it, it's, you know, it, it's kind of unusual, but occasionally we have just, um, you know, species that are less common um, be more pervasive on a single year. And I think this is one of those. Yeah. Cuckoos are elusive enough that it's it's uh, both black billed and yellow billed are they're they're hard birds to see and so they're and they're not so common so they're the sort of bird that birders get excited about seeing um, every single time because it always has that little bit of a feel of uh, the unexpected when you actually lay eyes on one or see one well and um, this the spring especially early summer has been pretty extraordinary for them. Um, like you said, there was sort of uh, speculation that it was because of cicadas, but I'll say there have not been a lot of cicadas in the places that I've been, um, like around my house in Evanston or some of the places that I've been birding, but there are a lot of cuckoos. So I think there's probably something else going on. Um, you know, they're known to follow caterpillar outbreaks, especially tent caterpillars. And so maybe there's unusual amounts of caterpillars in some places. Um, up at Goose Lake in McHenry County, which is mostly famous as a place where uh, yellow-headed blackbirds and black terns and other rare marsh birds breed. Um, but to walk out there, you have to walk through a wooded, um, you walk along a wooded bike path for about a mile. And there were an amazing number of caterpillars wander walking across that path on some of the days that I was up there. And uh, cuckoos seemed to be responding to that. But um, I also had them at least one, often two, sometimes even three in my backyard every single day uh, of June, pretty much. So wow. they've gone quiet the last few days. I, you know, they're, they're one of those birds also that's a lot more often heard than seen. It helps to know what they sound like to detect them. 
Um, and I had them calling every single day uh, that I was around. So that was really, really cool to see them. Um, I had black build once or twice, but it was mostly yellow build. Um, but yeah, that's been, you know, a lot of people have been chatting about how, how amazing a, a summer it's been for Cuckoo. Yeah. Yeah. What, I mean, such, such a neat bird when you, when, when one does get a chance to see one. Yeah. And um, I, I will say one more yellow build cuckoo fact, uh, yeah. since I've worked with peregrine falcons around the city a lot, monitoring them, and uh, I get to go up to their nests to, um, you know, to fan the chicks and study the chicks. And what we, one thing that we do when we up there, when we're at the nest, is we look around at the feathers that they've left from the, the prey remains. Peregrine falcons really like eating cuckoos. Wow. <laughs> yeah, they tend to be much better at finding cuckoos than, than human birders are. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, here I thought that they just pretty much ate like the pigeons of downtown Evanston or something like that. Or no, they, during migration, they eat the whole uh, smorgasbord of migrants, that, at least migrants of a certain size. You know, they like uh, birds that are about the size of, well, cuckoos, between cuckoo and pigeon size. <laughs> Holy cow. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, uh, all right. Well, let's move on to number four. Uh, number four goes back to uh, a date in May. It was a Friday in May uh, that was just incredible. And um, at Indiana Dunes, there was a massive movement of birds uh, migrating uh, along uh, the lakefront in Indiana Dunes State Park that morning. And, um, you know, people who were there standing at the tower and Indiana Dunes State Park described it as one of the most incredible moments of their birding lives. And, um, you know, this was a day in which there were state records fell. I mean, there were 300 Cape May warblers uh, seen, you know, hundreds of indigo buntings, Baltimore Orioles. Um, it just but wanted to put that in perspective, you know, birders are pretty happy if you see one or two Cape May warblers in a day, you know, one or two in, <laughs> in a morning in May and you're, you're pretty excited to have seen some Cape May warblers. So 300 is like, you know, that's totally unprecedented. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, I mean, there was, there's some great, uh, video and, 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 uh, uh, of that morning and what it was like to be up there and you just see people like people's you know heads and cameras swiveling constantly i mean it um you know it was may 15th friday may 15th and um you know this was a just an incredible day um i, I wrote about it for nature love chicago and that that post had our most uh, most visits uh most views of any post um during the whole effort so um you know it, to some you know the the Conditions were just right for that. There were, um, I think, must have been a, a front that came through with south winds pushing birds to the lakefront. And I can't remember exactly what the winds yeah, were. It was raining but to some, the night before it was raining. Okay, yeah. And to yeah. some extent, it was predictable, right? So some birders saw that these conditions were really good. Um, so Stephanie Bilkey went down from Chicago and, um, to to because she thought the conditions looked right. And spot they were spot on and you know the number that stood out to me i think they reported 900 baltimore orioles i don't know the list in front of me but yeah. just amazing birds and we had of course had brad on um one of our brad baumgartner um baumgarten on one of our live shows uh and he talked about that day and one thing that really stuck with me is that he estimates that they only identified five to ten percent um, I think it was five to 10% of the warblers that went by because they're just zipping by so fast. Um, so even when you see a number like 300 Cape May warblers, some of their other warbler numbers, the number of unidentified warblers would have been in the many thousands probably. And that's just an astounding uh, movement. Yeah. An amazing thing to witness. I wish I had been there. Yeah, and I, I just checked in the previous record for Cape May Warblers was 60. And, yeah. and many, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, there's just impossible to actually get an accurate count of birds sort of blurring, you know, past. And I, I still personally am having a hard time even uh, fathoming what that would <laughs> be like to experience. Um, and it's just, it's also amazing, you know, that that, that tower, this is at Indiana Dunes State Park on the lakeshore in Indiana, and they actually have a tower up there and dedicate, you know, it's known as a place to see birds migrating in spring, um, or especially early in the morning. And they have this tower and they have a paid counter there every morning. So it's a great way, you know, besides just being, a, having people there to witness these incredible days, you know, it's a great uh, long-term monitoring project. Uh, to keep track of populations of birds and migrating birds going through there. So it's a, it's a really good project um, in general. 
And I, th I think the, you know, Indiana Dunes, uh, just to give it a, a, an additional shout out, I mean, their birding festival had to be canceled this year, but that birding festival is on par with the, the top birding festivals in the Eastern US. And um, when I think of it, you know, we also had Allison uh, Vilag on from uh, Whitefish Point and, and, you know, Whitefish Point, Michigan. But I'm, like, to me, it's like Whitefish Point, Michigan, Point Pelee, um, you know, McGee, McGee Marsh um, and places like Indiana Dunes. I mean, Indiana Dunes is kind of in that, to me, in that conversation as a, as a funnel or as a migrant trap, um, you know, around the Great Lakes. And so it's, a, it's and, and Montrose Point, you know, can't, can't, leave Montrose <laughs> can't Point. forget Montrose. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm neglecting um, my, my, uh, my local patch. So, um, Awesome. So moving on, uh, speaking of which, uh, number three, Monty and Rose returning to Montrose Point and specifically Montrose Beach Dunes to nest uh, another year. I think it was a long awaited winter. Um, you know, would they return? Would they show up at the same place? When would they return? You know, are, were both of them okay? I mean, this was, you know, they had to survive thousand mile flights um, to their winter, thousand plus mile flights to their wintering grounds and back. Uh, but Monty and Rose returned on May 1st within hours of each other. And um, I think, you know, it was uh, during these uh, difficult, you know, sobering times that we're in, this was a bright spot. And I think there was a lot, there were people, at least I was uncorking a bottle of champagne and <laughs> celebrating the moment. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if others were, but I, 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 you know, we were toasting it. In fact, we did toast it when we had a, very, very next day, they, uh, we had a screening of the film on WTTW and did a virtual toast afterwards. So, I mean, it, it uh, was so great. Um, and I think there was a lot of uncertainty about, you know, would monitors be able to get out there? But actually, it's um, uh, been a great year and they picked a nice place to nest that was well out of, um, you know, where any flooding could take place. And, and they hatched all four eggs this go around. I mean, um, and now we're hopefully really close to fledging three, uh, three, three young piping plovers. So, um, you know, story, uh, the story just uh, continues to be um, an incredible story and there are new, new twists and turns always. And, um, you know, just, uh, I, I think just trying to put it in perspective of like, you know, what we would have thought in say like the eighties about like piping plovers nesting on, uh, Montrose Beach, it's just, that would have been, I think, unheard of. So, I mean, it continues to be um, just a, a, a wonderful success story on so many levels. Yeah, they're, and they're doing great. I mean, it's uh, such a strange year, but I mean, it seems like there's been a lot less drama with them in the second year, um, partially because they picked a good place to nest the first time, unlike last year where their first nest got flooded. Um, there's no people to deal with or many fewer people to deal with. The beach is closed, which is just incredible. Um, you know, there was a huge flock of gulls sitting there the other day, totally undisturbed. Um, and the, the plovers were off in their favorite area. Um, no concert drama this summer, right? No one's having music. You know, there's no concerts anyway. Uh, well, I mean, as but, one of my friends said, like, Monty and Rose have gotten exactly what they've always wished for, which is <laughs> a, a beach and, you know, totally closed and certainly no concerts being scheduled. Yeah, I mean, they just have to deal with the, the kill deer that they're uh, battling with every now and then, but they seem to have come to some sort of agreement um, about who, about <laughs> who, gets, to, who gets to live where. Um, so, yeah, it's been, it's been fun. I've been out monitoring once a week. Um, uh, last summer I was traveling most of the summer so I wasn't able to so it's been great to be able to get out there and uh, it was pretty amazing on Sunday you know which typically this is fourth of July weekend busiest weekend of the year for Montrose Beach and you know the the lifeguards and the and police and whoever else were, were really keeping people off the beach entirely and the uh, plovers were totally calm you know we almost right. didn't see them in the in the two-hour shift they were just sitting it was very hot they were just sitting resting um, but yeah, they're, they're doing great. It's a very good story. And it's one of those, um, there's been a lot of bad and difficult news recently. And so it's been nice to have, um, an injection of positivity from Monty and Rose every so often. Yeah. Yeah. And it, uh, you mentioned the gulls and I would say one of the big contrasts from last year is that because we had such a smaller, uh, you know, beach, uh, to work with and like volleyball was still active, et cetera, the gulls had all concentrated, which are 
plover predators potentially had con concentrated inside the enclosed area last year and that were a sort of constant threat. And this year, um, since there's almost no activity on the beach, those calls are hundreds yeah. of miles away. You know, it was um, funny, uh, not this past weekend, but the weekend before when I was out there, um, there was a freshly fledged juvenile ring-billed gull, right? They nest nearby, like yeah. down by Navy Pier. And, um, you know, it, had maybe, it must have just left the nest and arrived at Montrose for the first time. And, okay. you know, there are 200 gulls sitting on the beach and this one very young bird, you know, just a few weeks old came and landed right by the plovers, the plover area. Yeah. And immediately yeah. Monty and Rose went over, chased it away. The gull <laughs> left and, uh, you know, they had the Monty and Rose had their territory back to the, for themselves again. It was pretty neat to yeah. see. They're so indiscriminate about what they chase out of that mm -hmm. enclosed area. I'm just amazed by it. And they're, they're fearless when they go after, you know, much larger birds. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. And, um, you know, they're just the indomitable, this indomitable pair of yeah. birds. And, um, you know, they're, they're now beloved. We had another Chicago Tribune front page story about them a few days ago. Um, you know, shout out to Morgan Green, the reporter that's just kept on that story. And if not for her, uh, who knows where, you know, and her editors, like, where would we be? Um, yeah, they were mentioned on, uh, on a weekend edition on NPR, you know, national show one morning, which was, yeah. you know, I just happened to be listening. It was amazing to hear. Um, so cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we'll move on. Uh, number two. Um, so number two uh, is the, uh, the really awful incident that took place in Central Park uh, of where uh, birder Christian Cooper and board member of New York City Audubon Society was uh, falsely, uh, falsely ac accused of, of something by, by an irate uh, white woman. Christian is, uh, is African American and it was, uh, really, um, it was right in the Ramble, which is this uh, area in Central Park that I think is quite well known for, for birding. I, I don't know if it'd be considered maybe parallel to something like a Montrose in Chicago or- Yeah, or very similar. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and like, and, you know, I think if it, it um, you know, it, it uh, for what, for me, it revealed that how, how, um, how much privilege I have as a white male birder going out where almost wherever I want um, in the area without very many fears and um, without, you know, even having to think about these sorts of uh, threats and, um, you know, and the, um, you know, the, 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 you know, just awful kind of um, really, you know, really awful statements that the, this, uh, the woman who was a dog walker made toward him and, and even called the police and filed a false report. She's since been uh, charged uh, yeah. with a, a false report. Um, but it brought to light so much, not only about, I think, a lot of work the birding community needs to do um, to be more inclusive um, personally, I, I feel, but also just as a society in terms of... Yeah. You know, that video, anyone can go online and very easily find the video of the incident. It was really disturbing and distressing to watch. Um, a lot of birders have had uh, run-ins with off-leash dogs in, in wild places, and that's scary enough. But when you add how she weaponized um, Christian's blackness, you know, it was really a, a difficult uh, thing to watch. And there's been an amazing response, really, um, in the birding community, you know, to see Black Birders coming together and starting Black Birders Week, uh, which was just this incredible outpouring, or, uh, you know, it's just a great effort to see all these Black Birders coming out and saying, you know, telling the birding community the, the difficulties that they faced um, just for being Black and, go, and being a birder, um, which is a lot of things, that, a, a lot that um, we haven't thought about. You know, it's just, is not really at the forefront of most birders' minds. Um, and that's a privilege, of course, that we have as white birders, and the, the birding community is overwhelmingly white. So um, I don't know if you watched any of the Black Birder events. I watched a few of them. They were, it was really neat to see, to hear these stories, and um, it was encouraging as well, um, because there is an effort to uh, try to get more Blacks and other people of color into birding and into nature, 
um, all over the country. And that's something that uh, I think for the longevity of birding and also for the benefit of the birds themselves and for conservation is, is so critical. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, as birders, it's, uh, it is really incredibly encouraging to me to see, I think, yeah, Black Birders Week was a really bright spot in uh, what's been a, a dark time for, um, you know, both due to the um, unjust killing of George Floyd and, and um, the pandemic we are in the midst of. Um, but I, it, it was, um, but it's, it's a much needed initiative. And I think, um, you know, as birders and, I, you know, as people, I, I, I believe in, you know, we, we, there are strength in numbers and they're, you know, welcoming people into birding at every level is critically important. And I, I think, um, you know, not to go off here a little bit, but I think birding suffers from a lot of, uh, a lot of people who are real big know-it-alls. <laughs> and, um, and I think that that's really off-putting, but then you factor something in race, like race as well. Yeah. It's, man, we have- Yeah, one of, the, one of the stories that really stuck with me from that, um, from Black Birders Week that I heard was uh, uh, from Karina Newsom, who's a graduate student in Georgia. Um, I think she's studying seaside sparrows and salt marshes in Georgia, and that she actually has to go, uh, I think, through the neighborhood or very near the neighborhood um, where yeah, where Ahmad uh, yeah, where Ahmad Arbery was shot and murder. killed, yeah, um, was murdered. And I mean, that's you know, when you think about something like that, um, you know, and what she might have to face just from being in those areas with binoculars, you know. And, uh, you know, I think a lot, a lot of birders have had cops called on them at various times. Um, I have very recently. <laughs> but, you know, for me, it's, you know, when a cop comes out and asks me what I'm doing, it's a very, you know, it's a pleasant interaction. I, you know, I tell them I'm birding, they move on. But, you know, that's right. a, a, clearly a privilege of me as a white person, you know, and I thought recently, because it happened to me just a few weeks ago in the city, Oh, okay. Months ago in the city, um, where where about did it happen? Uh, right in my old neighborhood by Montrose. Um, okay. Amanda and I were out birding. Uh, walk. It was during the um, the beginning of the pandemic, so we couldn't really go anywhere far. So we would take walks around our neighborhood to look at birds, and uh, we had the cops called on us. And um, Chicago police officer came up to us with a smile. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hi. Right. What are you doing? We're, I said, we said we're birding. He said, okay, that's what I thought. Have a nice day, you know. But to think about how different that interaction could be for a black birder, um, you know, that's a really interesting thing to think about and uh, something that we have to, to reckon with and deal with. Absolutely. Yeah, it's harrowing. And I think, um, you know, I just, you know, I, it, I, 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 I shudder to think about how many people who could have been birders have been, um, <laughs> you know, are not birders because of, of this, uh, that, that, you know, this institutionalized racism in our, in our society. And I, I um, and so I, um, you know, I, I also want to mention that there was an incident in um, Indiana just over the weekend. Uh, it's worth looking up. It's, it's, it's um, disturbing, frankly. But it had to do with a, a, a black uh, person, a, a, a man who is, I, I think he might be an astronomer, or at least he's interested in astronomy, and it's simply gone out to a state park to look for, uh, to check out a lunar eclipse, and, um, and was uh, assaulted um, by, by a, group of, uh, a, group of, a group of white people. And it was um, really, a, I, I, it should be a, a hate crime. Um, and um, the uh, the officers who did arrive there uh, did not come to his aid, but rather uh, began talking to the assaulters. And um, and and I don't even though they had clearly committed a crime, I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure if they were even arrested, frankly. Um, so it's it goes it goes on and on and shows that this needs to be constant a constant yeah. focus. Um, and, and along those same lines, you know, now there's a reckoning with bird names, you know, English language bird names, common names of birds, you know, trying to um, modernize the names in a way so that uh, people who had a, a, 
racist or um, who had a racist past are not honored with common bird names. And that's a, you know, a whole nother issue and debate that's going on right now. But it's, you know, it's certainly related to um, racism in the outdoors and race, uh, systemic racism in, in our society. Absolutely. And um, yeah, those, uh, it's, you know, if nothing else, this has brought a lot of awareness to history and and much needed conversations and reflection about his, yeah. the way history is portrayed and the way it uh, continues to institutionalize these um, really prejudices that people have. Um, so uh, moving on to number one, uh, our top uh, five is concluding. And our number one is uh, the COVID related issues, the way the pandemic <laughs> affected birding, um, you know, and it, I think yeah. you could sort of hear that throughout our conversation. Yeah, we probably like, mentioned it a hundred times I've already. Probably referred to it in every one of these. Um, yeah, yeah but uh, the uh, the pandemic and and you know, which is been, I I don't mean to make light of it at all because you know we have had hundreds of you know one hundred thirty thousand plus people um, uh, die because of COVID nineteen and in Chicago we've had several thousand people pass away and even more in the state. And um, however, you know, as we take solace in this, what's really a sobering and difficult time, we are, we are human beings and we are birders and we are looking for, we have looked for ways to continue our pastime. And it, for me, I, I would say it's been an outlet uh, through some difficult times. And it's been one of the things that you could continue doing fairly uh, unchecked. And we'll talk about what the constraints have been, but um, our lakefront, being closed a big one um but then one of the uh sort of you know consequences of having a pandemic has been that people have been looking in their backyards more and have gotten into birding more and there's empirical uh evidence of this there's data from cornell lab of how many more people installed the merlin uh bird id app year over year in 2020 and and so how many more checklists are being submitted on ebird so um the pandemic has uh, you know, has had a big effect on, on birding um, and, and will continue to at some level. I mean, Josh, you're, you know, Red Hill birding, uh, you know, case in point, right? I mean, not, it, you know, so, uh, and, and so, but there are so many ways in which this has affected birding, but um, overall, I think it, it's been, uh, it's been, a, it's been for just for people who want to continue birding, we've mostly, we've been, had the good fortune to be able to mostly do that. And yeah, so. we had, had to do it a lot more locally maybe than, um, than people have in the past. You know, you couldn't travel as much. Uh, a lot of people are hesitant to chase rare birds that they might have chased. Um, you know, but people were discovering local parks that maybe they didn't, hadn't visited before, you know, that are near their house. And, you know, I know when I was still um, in April, March and April living close to Montrose and Montrose was closed, I was going to Graceland Cemetery for birding because that was still open. Um, you know, it was a, that was a place that I'd gone a few times, but I'd lived there for eight years and I went more, you know, more times this spring than probably cumulatively um, in the past. And, you know, that has a positive effect on data, right? You know, there's all of a sudden a lot more data available for Graceland Cemetery. The bird exactly. list for the cemetery probably grew. And that's a, you know, it's called a cemetery and arboretum. So they're quite proud of their uh, trees in their natural area that um, a birder, t uh, Ted Wolf, was involved with designing the natural area there. So, right, um, you know, that's one one small silver lining, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, you know, one thing that we haven't mentioned is that so many fewer people out probably meant good things for the birds, not just Monty and Rose, but other breeding birds yeah. and migratory birds were, were less disturbed. And um, I'm not sure that there's, other than Monty and Rose, that there is um, hard evidence of that yet, but um, you know, there's a lot of anecdotes about animals seen in places where people normally would be and um, that sort of thing. So yeah. um, that may yeah. maybe yeah. have been uh, the, the people staying home may be helpful for wildlife overall. Yeah, I think one of the things I'm struck by is like, you know, with Montrose closed, it was like, man, where are people going to go to get like their, you know, 20 warbler species in a single day? But people, uh, you know, got, got creative and went to places that had been maybe underbirded. Um, you had, you know, like uh, one, you know, example I'll throw out there, like a cerulean warbler, I think was seen in Washington Park. Like, I, you know, maybe, I don't know if that's been reported there before, but, it, you know, it was just, 
just in Washington Park, I was, that's a great example. I went down there three or four times and had never been there. Um, so, I, I mean, it, uh, it, it was um, an interesting year, but I, I'm impressed by how many, I think that probably the biggest limitation was with shorebirds. I think, you know, if, if the uh, lakefront had been open, we would have likely, at least in Chicago, I know people yeah. were up at Washington Beach, but I think, you know, we, we were at, at least someone well, like sort of an inter intermediate level. I don't have almost any shorebirds on my, yeah. on my list. So. Well, now we have almost the best situation for, you know, speaking about shorebirds specifically because Montrose uh, is not allowing people. And with no people, there's no dogs, no off yeah. dogs. There's a big, a big uh, wet spot on the beach with it. We know yeah. what shorebirds like. So potentially as shorebirds start migrating, um, which they are starting now, it's, yeah, we don't think of the 4th of July as fall, but shorebirds are already making their way south. Um, right. But, uh, maybe we'll be in for some shorebird treats this fall in Montrose, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you're seeing there are some pictures coming out of Montrose on July 4th from Plover monitors of a completely empty beach. And when was the last time yeah. on July 4th in Chicago, there was a completely empty beach? Wow. Um, so... Um, well, this is a, you know, the, the pandemic's not going away fast, at least not in the U.S., so um, there's still a lot of time to see how this all plays out in terms of birds and birding, because uh, it may be that, you know, we're still under some sort of restrictions in the fall, and people are going to still have to be birding very locally, and um, we don't know the status of the parks uh, on the east, east of Lakeshore Drive still when they're going to be open, um, so there's still, still a lot of uncertainty surrounding uh, the pandemic and regulations about the about uh, our behavior, so still right. remains to be seen what's going to happen Absolutely. in the coming months. Yeah, and, and there's certainly there could be you know return to more uh, more closures and more restrictions um, given yeah. um, trends. Well, well, I know I will be continuing to burden my backyard a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's pretty amazing to be, and I moved into a house in May. Uh, with a big yard and so it's been great to you know may was awesome in my yard got to <laughs> go out every morning and see what warblers and tanagers and vireos and thrushes were yeah. coming through and um, i will be doing a lot more of that as birds start uh, migrating south and yeah uh, i still have, i still have a blue gray gnat catcher and red-eyed vireo around and i mentioned nice. cuckoos that seem to have disappeared in the last few days but um won't be too long before the first uh migrant land birds start coming through to the first uh Tennessee warbler and northern water thrush and Swainson's right. thrush and some of the really early ones. So, yeah. So we. Uh, so um, that is the conclusion of our, um, our our spring season. We did. I think this is our eleventh episode of this week in birding. Um, we're going to take a pause. Just see so uh, all our anybody who's watching knows we're going to pause uh, for now and hopefully come back in the fall. Uh, with some some new episodes as uh, as birds make their way uh, back through this area and um, and until then I think you know you'll be hearing more from me about Monty and Rose um, Josh any highlights on on the Red Hill birding front you want to mention start offering some local trips again in the fall so you can uh, follow Red Hill birding on Facebook to find out about that or uh, probably an even better way is to go to redhillbirding.com. Uh, sign up for the, the newsletter, the email newsletter that I send out really just a few times a year um, to find out about the, some local trips. We're doing very small groups, uh, self-driving with a, a guide so that, uh, you know, you can maintain social distance and we're not all cramped in a single nice. vehicle. Um, yeah. And uh, they were a lot of fun this summer. You know, I saw uh, least, least bitter and four straight trips to Goose Pond and Black Turn every time we went up nice. there. And, um, you know, I've got a couple of my, my friends leading those trips too, Matt Gleski and Adam Sell, and I may even add uh, one or two more people this fall. So Absolutely. yeah, come out and join us and get out birding with other people again. Yeah, cool. And uh, yeah, great, great. Uh, it's been great uh, having these conversations with you, Josh. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, we'll look forward to getting back in touch soon. And uh, thanks to everybody who's, who's kept up with this week in birding. It's been a lot of fun.